And I'm just really delighted that our next presenter is Dr. Barbara Mann. She has published extensively. She knows, she's a wise woman. She knows all kinds of things. She comes to us from the Honors College. She has been here before. We always enjoy having her join us because she's always insightful and teaches us things that we did not know. And her topic this, morning, this afternoon is, oh, and if you hear the smoke alarm, I found four of them and changed the batteries. I have no idea where this last one is. I put so many in this apartment and I just can't find it, even with it peeping. So it's sort of funny. I, it would have been worse when all four of them were going. But I got four of them. I got up on my step stool and you have to get way up in the ceiling and I did it. But the last one is hidden. So that's because these are such hot topics. I think of and it as a timekeeper. And we're just, bur yes, it's the timekeeper and we're just burning with passion for this, this whole thing. So Dr. Mann is going to talk to us about band female leaders of the Eastern Woodlands. And it's all yours now, Dr. Mann. Okay, well, first I gotta figure out how to share. Little green box on the bottom and click it and it should then let you. Is that working now? Can well, I you to, there, now it is. Good job. And then hit, then hit slideshow at the top of your, PowerPoint. There, great. Oh, no, I've got it. Okay. All right. Well, I thought I was presenting yesterday, so the date's wrong, but here we are. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, I'm a little first today. What else would have? I thought I'd start out by telling you what the woodlands are, because I found that even Americans have no idea what these two woodlands are. So I found this handy dandy map by uh, Jelena Maxwell. And she's got the various parts of Turtle Island, which is North America, uh, parsed out. You see the green here, and my little you are here has kind of got slid over in the wrong place somehow. But you are right here in the little corner of Lake Erie. All of this green is eastern woodlands, and what it means is it was entirely forest before the Europeans ranked. That goes a little past the Mississippi River, which is near about here. And we don't see the Mississippi the way the rest of Europeans do. We see it as going up to the Ohio and then turning and going up to the Allegheny, the Great Horn Serpent, uh, proceeding down from the Great Lakes down to the Mississippi Delta. So this is all woodlands. And we're talking about all the people that live east of Mississippi, more or less. All right. We are very involved with the stories of origin, which are completely different from Western European and, by the way, Middle Eastern stories, which is where the Europeans got their monotheism from was the Middle East. Instead of monotheism, we have a multiplicity of spirits, none of whom are gods. They only know what themselves. Um, by and large, the entire universe is parsed out into twin space. There are spirits of breath, which uh, tend to have a, a sort of male cast to them, although they're not men. And then there are spirits of blood, which have a female cast to them although they're not women. Uh, and this is a drawing here by uh, Guyonis, that and his Mohawk. It's one of the versions of uh, how planet Earth came to be. And you see a dance or again, depending on the dialect you speak. She's coming down from uh, Skyworld, Kentucky, Skyworld, where here he is looking down as she's kind of falling. Um, Planets are blood, 
which means the heart pumping, which means the marrow of the bone, which means the spleen, all places where blood products collect. That tends to be cast as um, female, although that's not a really good presentation. Um, it's always a gun, which is the, uh, it can be a trickier wrinkle, but uh, a female, uh, not male. Um, and then Uki is going to be uh, the breath spirit, where he is up there. Sky means outer space, and he's up there in outer space. She's coming down, she's going to be creating female space of planet Earth, of planets to female. And what this means is that all the woodland cultures, we all have a version of this story, is that the woodland cultures are all matriarchal. Uh, matriarchy does not mean women hate men, all men must die. It means that the female impulse of creation on Earth is, is a female impulse. The male impulse of creation is out there in outer space. So in the woodlands, identity goes through the first mothers, through the first daughters, into the modern world. And I found this really neat picture of two Odawa clan mothers uh, in the uh, Toledo Lucas County Public Library archives. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure, a mother and daughter, although they weren't sure themselves. It's from about 1890. So you can see what the Odawa women looked like in 1890. The Odawa are primarily up in Michigan. There's a little bit that comes down starting in the Swanton area but mainly the people going west to uh, Indiana of uh, those groups, the yeah, Anishinaabe groups, are uh, the Potawatomi. Uh, the Iroquois are um, lower Lake Erie. We're, we're below Lake Erie. Toledo, Ohio was the cutoff area. In fact, the Oliver House was the old large council ground for all the people of this area. So we're sitting right now on Seneca land. But I thought this was a really neat photograph. And you can see the importance of the mother and the daughter uh, connection. Uh, it's really important to understand that gender does not work anything like it does in Western culture. Uh, in the first place, no human being is gender. You don't have a gender. The jobs are gender. Whatever job you're doing at the moment, you have that gender. Um, so women can be made men, like for example, if you're going to be a soldier, uh, you are now male. Uh, men can be made women, for example, if they're going to be judges. Judging as a job is female. So the men are female at that point. We also have third and fourth genders. We didn't have trans because that's something that's allowed by um, Western medical science. It, it was not something that we could manage at that point. We had four genders. Uh, and the main thing to remember is that human beings are not really gendered. It's the job you're doing. That's a very, very common feature of matriarchies around the world, by the way, that jobs are gendered. All right, so in the um, women's matriarchies and the end, uh, photos of all of us here are kind of cutting off what's going on. Um, in the drawing from 1724, you can see a <coughs> council, women-led councils, which is not something the Europeans know how to deal with, so they threw men into the women's councils here. But women's councils were for women. If you saw a man there, he was made woman, to sit and listen to what the women said, and then go dressed as a woman to talk to the men's council and tell them whatever was sent for the men. But women held our own clan councils, men held the national councils. Um, women alone nominated all officers of all the clans and nations. And just think what the U.S. Congress looked like today if only women could nominate people to office. We nominated men as well as women, but only women could do the nominating. <clears throat> we also impeached anybody that was getting out of line. That was our job alone. Um, we alone owned all the food, all the housing, and all the land. 
only women could declare war and only women could call off war. And that wasn't women generally, it was grandmothers. Grandmothers are very hesitant to send the children out to kill each other. And by and large, in our wars before your kids, you were going to get killed. The idea was not to kill somebody, it was just to push somebody off the field. And most of our wars were more like um, an Olympics competition. There were usually sports going on, and whoever won the game won the event. Get down uh, the tail of turtle, which is uh, Mexico, Central America, and uh, with the uh, Aztecs and then part of the Inca, you would have worse for people that killed up here. We outlawed killing people, we just didn't go in the world. Um, we also alone were able to appoint soldiers to go. If the grandmothers didn't say you were a soldier and you could go, you were going to go. Um, also, we controlled the agenda of a men's national conscience. The men, by law, were not allowed to discuss an issue the women had not sent forward. So we had speakers, and um, a couple of the men that you saw on the prior screen, I, I can't get back to it because of my computer, but we would have men who would, who would sit in the women's council and then take whatever message we had to the men's council. They dressed like women. They um, were completely outfitted like women, but they would take women's words to the men. And by uh, converse, there would, would be women sitting in the men's councils dressed as men, uh, identified as male for that purpose, coming to the women's councils to bring whatever men had to say. Um, here was uh, in the picture there is a Gipio Ita. He was uh, called Red Jacket by the Europeans. He was a speaker of the women uh, to men. Now, a really funny thing was that when the Europeans first got here, the idea of a man dressing like a woman or a woman dressing like a man, that was an outrage. It was against the law. It was horrible. You could get killed. But... So when they saw all our men come into their meetings, the European meetings, the traders, and they were dressed like women in skirts and dresses and wearing women's kinds of necklaces and carrying their corn pounders, which were a sign of office. They were, they were just like hysterical. And um, in 1724, Lafayette was writing one of the first early anthologies, was practically hysterical. You can read it in his um, documents. He was screaming, her man paradise. Oh, they outrage nature. Oh, all these people, women dressed like men. Women dressed like women. Oh, what should we do? Um, because that considered a real outrage to Europeans. And there's one pretty funny little event when uh, John Eckwell, who was a Moravian missionary, at 16, he was adopted by the uh, Turtle clan of the Lenapes, they gave him his, his spirit name, which he was so stupid he didn't know he should say out loud, so he recorded it. Um, <laughs> they also, once he was adopted, they handed him his skirt and his corn pounder because the Lenapes were gendered female. So all Lenapes at the time were gendered female, and he was practically hysterical at the thought that he was going to be wearing a skirt. But all that meant is we had appointed them judges. They, they had a regular job, everybody's got a job. And their job was to, uh, to be the judges. He didn't understand that, so he wouldn't wear a skirt. <laughs> all right, so there were marks of office. And women would wear, uh, you can see the, the um, collars here, the necklaces and the collars, badges of office, you can see her here. Um, and she's receiving some, what she's receiving here is wampum. Uh, whenever you went to another council, you had to bring your authorization. So this belt here was her authorization to come and speak to this council. It's sort of like carrying your passport if you're going to Canada or Mexico or Europe or Asia. Um, you need your passport or they're not going to let you in. Right? There's a rumor that's still in all the textbooks 
had a lump of was money. No, it was not money. It was a writing system. It was a character writing system. Something like old Chinese. Certain characters and certain things. And so this boat would have had the characters on it saying what her office was and who sent her and how she was authorized to be there. Um, there I know some of what those characters are. A few other people still know. But the last fluent reader of Wampum died in the 1920s, it was like 1922. There is a full set of Wampum the guy we know. Uh, it's at, I believe, Akwasashi, which is one of the reservations. Uh, they don't take it out much because uh, Wampum is made of clay hog shells, beads. So you make these little beads out of uh, the shell. And obviously they get crushed easily. There was purple and there was white. It was called black. So you had black characters on white or white characters on black. And if character was white, not one thing, if it was purple, it meant another thing. It was a very complex writing system. But the thing with that was, you didn't have to all speak the language to be able to read the characters. Just like old Chinese characters, anybody across Asia could read them regardless of their language because the character always meant the same thing. It was not sound-based, it was image-based. So she's bringing her wampum to present to this woman, authorizing her as a speaker or an official. All right, um, pounding out the corn, that's why you had a corn pounder. See this woman right here in the middle? She's got the corn pounder. When the corn kernels are first out, they can be very, very hard. So they have these big, huge pounders and they drop um, right on the corn. And eventually that hard kernel would be smooth and flour, would turn into flour so we can make things. Um, so we likened taking a hard problem and pounding on it, pounding on it, pounding on it until it was all smoothed out. And that was our metaphor of judging. So uh, an image of a little corn pounder in the month, that would be a judge, that, that would mean judging something. So you can see the different tasks that, that people were running, the women were running here in this particular picture. So she's pounding out the corn so they can make better. But all judges are female, whether or not they're men. Doesn't matter, all female. Uh, women were chiefs. And that's something the textbooks really need to catch up to. At least half and better than half of all public officials, female, were civil chiefs. War chiefs were usually but not always men. We have female war chiefs. But civil chiefs uh, pretty much were in charge of everything domestically going on. War chiefs were like military generals or colonels. All right, here's one. Uh, this is an image of uh, De Gaulle with Tones. You may know her as Molly Brandt. She was Mohawk. Um, what we used to do when a new group came in with a language we didn't know, we would get some adolescents who would be volunteers. We wouldn't just send them, they'd be volunteers. You go over there and you learn in this instance, you go learn English. And then you come back to us in a few years, you know English and you know Mohawk, so now you can translate for us. And we expected the Europeans to send some of their adolescents to learn our language and go back, but somehow they never got around to Anyway. One of the jobs of the uh, civil chiefs here, like the Conquadonte, was to decide the fate of captives. Any captive taken in war, what, one of two things would happen, be adopted or be executed. Now, under Whitman's law, matriarchal law, you didn't just keep people endlessly as prisoners the way you're sword. Um, we would replace anybody your side killed you would have to provide somebody to take the place of whoever you killed in our nation so the population would continue. So almost all of the people taken in any kind of an action were adopted in, especially when children always adopted in. Uh, men, some might be executed by 
for the executed, not because we are savages and bloodthirsty, but because um, they committed crimes against humanity. The Europeans committed a lot of crimes against the Indians, so some of them would be executed for their crimes. And it was up to the female chiefs here, the Gomba Dante, to decide the fate of these captives. This is uh, actually from 1781, uh, talking about the uh, Lempi, Lempi peace women with civil chiefs. Uh, they, who had quoted or had been taken prisoner. On all occasions where they made a halt, that is the march as they were on the way to the women of the village, and he wasn't being very specific about it, it was the chiefs, would take um, over the prisoners, and they would stand by and feed them and take care of them and provision them until such time as they went on. That was another thing that the uh, small chiefs did. Uh, here's another chief. Uh, this is called Queen. The Europeans would uh, call any civil chief a queen because they didn't know what it was. Uh, this, her name is Catherine Montour. And yes, she's Seneca. Um, Shukwaga was her town. Um, her name is Catherine Montour, which sounds French, but what we would do is anybody who was notable in a prior generation, we would turn their name into a title of office and then it would pass down. One of the things the Queen Mothers did was keep all the names. And you could not give somebody a name that was already being used. So for as long as I'm alive, Nobody else in the family can be named Barbara because I'm learning that name. We don't want to confuse the spirits now. Uh, and so names would pass down as titles of office if that person was notable in a prior generation. And the original Catherine Montour, who had been named by the Europeans, even though she was uh, Seneca, was a very notable and wise person. So her name passed down and her great grandniece, this one, uh, received that name. Uh, she led, she led uh, war during the 1779 campaign in the American Revolution to wipe out the Iroquois. And she was a chief who had to take over as a war chief for a while. Um, by the way, my name, Barbara, was passed down. My great, 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 maybe another great and their grandmother um, had been captured. She always put it as captured in the story by the uh, French nuns and thrown into one of their schools for uh, Indian children. Uh, she refused to get with the program, so uh, the nuns, the French nuns were really disgusted and they called her La Barbara, which means the barbarian. <laughs> when she was 16, she stole a canoe and paddled down uh, around across the lake, Lake Erie, down the Mongol door. She knew the whole that tour, and they adopted her in, of course. But she didn't get rid of her name, La Barbara. She kept it because she earned that name. So it passed down through the generations. So my name is actually Barbara. It's the Barbara. And I used to be called you know, the Barbara. That's what La Barbara is. So I'm the barbarian, aren't um, but that was a notable name, and I was given that name uh, to carry it for. Here you see a Lenape woman. This is from a drawing done in 1654. Uh, Lenape woman, she's dressed as a soldier. She's, she's obviously a man. Um, the Dutch who drew this decided that he was her husband. Nah, he'd be her brother. He was a <laughs> primary male uh, figure in the family was not a woman's husband or a man who she produced children with, but her brother. Very common pattern in matriarch is that the, the uh, maternal brother is the role model for little boys like this kid right here. I uh, notice he's got a little bow and arrow, even though she's got a hatchet and he's got a hatchet. That's because you don't want the little kid hurting themselves. More likely to hurt themselves on a hatchet than on a bow and arrow. So he's got his little boy in there. Anyway, she's a soldier. She's a soldier. And I was given a warrior's name too. I told them I didn't want it. They said too bad. 
So I've got a lawyer spirit, spirit thing. <coughs> Women alone controlled all the food, all the housing, all the land. They alone owned it by law. And that was true throughout the woodlands, although I'm pulling up the Iroquois Constitution here because we have a modern version of it. Uh, it was formed in the year 1142, second oldest constitution, uh, constitutional uh, democracy in the world. The oldest was actually the Icelandic Hall thing, which was set up in 932 and 936 at Lake Ridge. But our constitution says women are the progenitor of the nation. Remember the woman on the progenitor of the nation. They shall own the land and the soil which means anything else on it or produced by it. That's law in the Constitution. So here she is, this is a miracle woman, and she's got a, by the way, a war hatchet here too. <laughs> they, they were more concerned, Europeans were more concerned with the, the soldiers than anybody else because they ran away. So the housing, this is actually Algonquin housing, long houses. They were wrong because an entire lineage was living there under the grandmother of that lineage. So this was probably the grandmother, and then here would be when her daughters or granddaughters would set up their own, there'd be the smaller ones, because their family wasn't as big yet. And uh, the Iroquois housing was actually rectangular instead of a curve. It might have a bit of a curve on the top, but it would by and large be rectangular. So this, this is more Algonquin, this would be a Lenape, um, Mohegan, Lenape. Uh, in any case, this was supposed to be Manhattan in the 1500s. Uh, women owned all the food. Okay, now if you're gonna control people, that's a good way to do it. Cause they don't eat, if you make grandma mad, <laughs> stay on the this is a drawing by uh, just <clears throat> around 1910, more or less, about when he was drawing this. This would have been his great 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 grandfather, Sublime Daniel, who would go out in the cornfield to talk to the spirit of corn. If you see there, that's the spirit of corn. Even though the women's crops and corn are female, one of the three sisters. The tassel, corn tassel growing up here. And see how he's got a little tassel here. That would be Otita, that would be male. Um, because it's reaching up, going up to the sky. Anything that grows straight up is associated with males, like mountains straight up. Anything that's a cave-like, womb-like is female. So all caves are going to be female. So the top of corn here, the tassels. That, that used to be male. So when Chikoi Shashe, who was the first clan mother of the Iroquois, Seneca, when she was involved in the war against the Among Builders to set up democracy, and that was in the 12th century, her um, war plume was the corn, corn tassel, corn silk. So here's Nanyadayo, who was a prophet. He came out to talk to the spirit corn who's going to whisper in his ear there. But the women alone on the corn. Um, this is another, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I put it on the side where, at least on my screen, all the uh, pictures of people are. But here, over here, you can see a field up here. This is a European conception. We actually had planting mounds. We didn't like stoop. We thought it was still bad, that's what this was. But so we made palms, which were conceived of as breasts from Mother Earth. And then we would plant the, plant the corn on the top, um, the uh, green beans around the base, and the green beans would crawl up. They were like a little sister crawling up their big sister. Uh, and if you've got little kids around the house and you were older, you know how to climb up your leg. So that was the little sister of beans. And then every third or fourth pound, we'd plant the squash because squash is a runner. Boom. It'll just run all over. 
Every comic and every story of course, otherwise it take over everything, you know, the wild little sister running around making noise. So that's how we set it up. So they've got a cornfield here with just corn because it was hard for Europeans to understand coke mining. That was not something they did, so they didn't understand it. So instead of seeing what they saw, they'd see what they expected to see and draw it that way. This was from a 1590 drawing by John White. Okay, we held all the prisoners for adoption or execution, as I said. Now, if I were one of these three guys, I wouldn't hold out a lot of hope. But they're clearly marked for execution. For us, they're going to be adopted. So I don't know what these three guys did, but it was pretty bad. Um, this made the Europeans crazy because in their culture, women did not decide the fate of anybody. Still less did they hold captives, still less did they run executions. We did. Okay, here is a case of adoption. This is supposed to be little Mary Jemison, uh, who was Seneca. She became an adoptee and much loved, much loved by everybody. In fact, to this day, her name Jemison is a very proud name for uh, Seneca with that name, a very proud name. Uh, women and children were always about, always about. Um, if you were a woman, you were going to be killed. You would better have done something really bad. Uh, that almost never happens. Children certainly adopted. And here she's being dressed, undressed from her European clothes to be dressed again as a little Seneca girl. Uh, she became the Columbia. And she was um, had married first to a Lenape man whom she loved very much. And then after he died, Seneca man that she respected. And I don't get the impression she loved him that well, but um, this was her as a little girl. She was actually taken about the age of 12 in a raid, and of course she was adopted. And here we are conducting executions. Um, Bash on this guy. This guy's got a rope around his middle held by a couple of different people. You can see this high school and this high school. And uh, the women are running this execution. Well, it looks like they're letting their men whack him, although she's coming up to take a shot. Um, you know, sometimes the prisoner would be clubbed to death. Most often, he'd be burnt. Um, and this is a depiction of one of the executions that the women would have ordered. And so he, he would be burnt to a crisp is what he would be, because we didn't want any choice of them left in his ashes would be scattered so that they couldn't be coalesced. That was reserved for really bad criminals. And the Europeans, of course, just went bananas when they saw women doing it. And that's where uh, women got their reputation. Oh, the savage even though they executed people in really horrible ways themselves. Okay, we impeached a lot of people. And uh, here was a guy. I'll get to it here in my office. Um, the he was impeached. He was the sitting chair of the Men's Grand League. And ta -da -da. Um, and he was impeached in 1846 because he was violating orders. I mean, it's something like impeaching a president. Uh, he didn't do it often, but if you're really made angry enough, and that's what that name means, he makes them angry. And that became his name after he was impeached. Um, afterwards, he was nobody, he didn't have a place. And here's an actual photograph of him after he was impeached. He was impeached in 1874. This was probably about 18, 85, 1890. He lived, he was still alive in 1909 and nobody quite knows what happened to him when he died, probably 1910, 1912. Um, what was his crime? He converted to Christianity. And that may strike Americans. Oh, it's an individual. No, it wasn't because um, Christians who converted were used by the missionary to force conversion on everybody else. Extremely
extremely disruptive to the culture because it brought in all these attitudes and behaviors and values that simply were not Seneca, were not Iroquois, were not equivalent at all. Uh, in the first place, it was patriarchal, not patriarchal. In the second place, um, laws were very, very different. So this was very disruptive to culture at the time. So he was um, impeached and thrown out of office. So of course, the United States being very patriarchal, oh, very patriarchal at the time, was quite horrified by the power of women exhibited in this culture. So they took it upon themselves to civilize us, which meant taking away all women's power, crushing the third and fourth genders, forcing people into sexual stereotypes, and that was civilized. So here they've got a bunch of little girls and they're forcing them to do nothing but girl work. <laughs> this was missionaries who were all male, of course. Indian agents, all male. Federal officials, all male. Federation officials, all male. And they did really horrible things to the women. Um, to force them to and including killing them if they wouldn't get the program. And this is a photograph of the little girls being forced into girl mode. And you can see behind them some little boys being forced into boy mode. Now they're little pinafores, they're little heads. And if you look at it, this little girl on the left kind of looks like a cousin. Uh, if you look at them, they do not look very happy to me. No. So there were no more female leaders in the programs the Europeans had. Now those on the reservations, they could force into a lot of things, although the women resisted very heavily until the 1840s, 1848. They could not force women. And that's the point where they just flatly co-op female leaders. You were not allowed to impose a, a phony constitution on us. And then 1868, another one that was even worse. That was after the Civil War. It was like before and after the Civil War. But they've been trying since 1818 with the First Intercourse Act to do this. And this continued through the Civil Rights era. Indigenous women, in fact, indigenous people, did not get their rights back until the Civil Rights Act from 63 to 65 not only were for African Americans, but for Native Americans. So Native Americans are well aware of what Dr. Martin Luther King did for us too. Although a lot of people seem unaware of that. A lot of women did not get back the right to vote, even though they were also considered American citizens until 1964 or 65. I like them. Here, get down to it. It's many spotted wool. And you can see she refused to get the program. <laughs> She's gendered male there as a hunter. <laughs> Good for you, many. So um, right now, people are still seeking to reclaim their former cultural powers and their former cultural ways. Uh, one of the things that I was charged with by my elders was to set the record straight. So I've been doing my best here. Here Queen Women, first book, well, actually the second book was the first big thing I did, came out in the year 2000, and that was receding uh, the uh, matriarchy based on the old laws and pulling up all the documentation for that. And the second one, this came out in 2016, Spirits of Love, Spirits and Breath. It's talking about the twin cosmos and the proper interface, it's constantly in motion and shifting. So uh, the idea is to keep Ogi, how are you going? And the Orenda balance. So that's what I've got for you today. Well, thank you, Dr. Mann. Would we have questions for Dr. Mann? We sure would get some applause, but do we have any questions? Do we have any questions 
in Facebook or YouTube. Well, I thought that was very interesting. The Europeans must have had to crush the women to get rid of the, mar the matriarchy. I worked on it for 400 years. Uh, there's a, a book by Karen Anderson, it's quite good. She starts with the earliest French missionaries. You know, Cartier got up there in 1534, 35. And the very first French missionaries in, of course, horrified. And they uh, got the lowest elements of the men, the ones that weren't in office, you know, as scopes, and gave them power as Christian captains and advised them. One of the first things they said when the women wouldn't cooperate with them, chain her by one foot. And that's the name of Karen Anderson's book, Chain Her by One Foot. And she goes through what all the early missionaries did and force women into the oppressed mode of a Western women. Great storyteller. We have a question at Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, they are saying, what a great storyteller you are, Dr. Mann. What were the third and fourth genders? Well, gay and lesbian. We call it women who like women, men who like men. And typically, they were considered boundary crosses. You know, they're, um, I know that an awful lot of, there's a, an urban legend out there that, um, oh, gay people are two-spirited. No! Everybody's two-spirited. I have the spirit of blood I got from my mother. And the spirit of breath I got from my father. Those are the two spirits, and it's my job as a personality of this life to coordinate their agendas, keeping that kind of balance, right? Um, third and fourth genders are something entirely else. They're boundary crossers, right? Something that looks like a natural boundary to what the rest of us, right? And uh, uh, me liking men or men liking women. It's almost a natural boundary, but there are people who walk right across it with ease now. Whoa! You know, we've got a lot of animals we like for doing that, like bears. Bears are animals, they walk on all fours, but they also walk on twos. They eat exactly the same diet as human beings. They walk on twos, and he lives in a house. Hey, right? Oh my, he's a boundary. He must no more than the rest of us. We should listen to him. Serpents have a really good reputation with us. Why? Well, they can live in water. They can live on the land. They can live under the ground. They can live in trees. That's four different places they can live. Whoa! Boundary crossing. We must know more than the rest of us. We should listen to him. So gays and lesbians. Whoa! That's a, wow, they must know more than the rest of us. So they're usually a shaman. We have more questions. Did they have somebody assigned to tell the stories of the group? Um, there would be people who were better at it than others, because you know there are people who are better at telling stories. Than others. Usually by default, they would wind up knowing. But in everybody's family, you know, it was usually the elders, it was primarily the elders. You would go and they say, oh, grandmother or grandfather, you've lived many years, you must have seen many things, and you know so much more than I, what can you tell me of things past or things unseen? And then they'd tell you. And after a while, you knew which one would tell the best stories. <laughs> My great-grandmother was really good storyteller. My grandfather was a great storyteller. Every family's got the person or persons that were really good at it, and you just kind of know who they were. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Mann this afternoon? Uh, 
But there is a question from uh, YouTube and uh, from Camille. It says, do you have any suggestions for resources to explore this further? Well, I got from my book, so you want to, um, The Iroquoian Woman, which is not considered a classic, it's taught all over the world, and uh, Spirits of Blood, Spirits of Breath. People really like that one, too. I tried to write them in a non-academic way so that you didn't have to have a PhD to understand what I was saying. Some of my other things are more pure history, but there are other people besides me writing as well. Um, once you start seeing us cite each other, you get an idea of who the people are. Thank you. So are there more questions? Anybody from Facebook wanting to know anything this afternoon? No, I think the Facebook question, last one was about the third and fourth genders, but that, that's pretty much that, and then you've heard the one from YouTube. Well, I would like to thank you so very much, Dr. Ram. Okay. As always, you just bring to us fresh material. I love the stories, too. I love the color in the slides. I love the authenticity that you find to put in them. We are blessed indeed that you were able to share your work with us today. I also enjoyed the HIV in the Rust Belt. I thought that was pretty fabulous.